President Aploik, Vice Presidents, Deans, members of the Harvey Prize Council and Jury, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. When I received a phone call from Professor Aploik last summer informing me that I have been selected to receive the Harvey Prize 2005, I was truly delighted. I feel greatly honored to have received this prestigious award and to join the roster of distinguished colleagues who have received this prize since 1972. Thank you so much. It is always a pleasure to visit Israel, a country which more than others values science, both as a basis of its economic future, but also as a cultural endeavor and a country which excels in science. I have had and I have numerous collaborative projects with colleagues and friends in this country which are both productive and very enjoyable. And I may add here, I do appreciate not taking this for granted, the spirit of looking forward and working together towards a brighter future. The citation as read by Vice President Aviv Rosin refers to our work on the molecular machinery of cellular protein quality control and to the development of cryo-electron tomography. At a glance, it may seem that these are two rather disconnected topics, but they are not. The development of new technology for studying supramolecular architecture in unperturbed cellular environments will allow us to look at protein quality control from a new angle. I think most of you will know that almost all functions in a living cell are performed by proteins, whether it's as structural elements, as catalysts, or as transporters, or as molecular motors. Now, proteins, again, as most of you know, are linear chains of amino acids with specific sequences as determined by the genes encoding them. According to one of the dogmas of biology, DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein, but the, pro the protein is synthesized initially as an unstructured, as an unfolded chain. And in order to become functional, it has to fold into a uniquely determined conformation. Now, in principle, all the information that is required for a protein to fold properly and to become functional is contained in its primary structure. However, things are different in the context of the cell, which is a very crowded environment. And the risk is very high that the protein doesn't assume a correctly folded state. The risk is high that it misfolds and eventually aggregates. The initial steps of folding are pretty fast and they reach a compact intermediate state. However, that compact intermediate state, the transition from that to the final native and functional state is a slow one. And so this compact intermediate state is very prone to aggregation. And as most of you will know, there are many diseases, in particular neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, Kreuzfeld-Jakob, or Huntington's disease, which are characterized by progressive misfolding and aggregation of proteins. Now, in order to minimize the risk of misfolding and aggregation, or to reverse the process of misfolding, the cell had to invent a sort of a protein quality control mechanism. And there are essentially two elements to protein, cellular protein quality control. There are, on one hand, the molecular chaperones, which can safeguard the folding process of other proteins by preventing unproductive interactions between folding intermediates. So the molecular chaperones are, act like this chaperone, a lady which makes sure that these two people do not get into inappropriate contacts. Now, in addition to the, cellular, well, to the chaperone systems, cells have another mechanism, and that is the, inner, the irreversible removal and degradation of proteins by cellular protein degradation systems. Now, as has been mentioned, we have worked on both systems, the chaperone systems and the protein degradation machinery of the cell. 
back in the early 90s, we discovered in a very serendipitous manner a chaperonin, which we later named the thermosome. We named it the thermosome because it massively accumulated in cells upon heat shock. And the experiment we did at the time was that, well, we were studying something completely different, as a matter of fact. We were looking at cell surface structures and we performed lysis of these cells directly on the EM grid. And what we observed then was a massive spill of molecules released by these cells. And since this was a consequence of stress or heat shock, we named them thermosomes. And in the, couple, in, in the following years, we went into a very detailed characterization of this thermosome, which then became the archetype of a whole class of chaperonins, the so-called group two chaperonins, which are the main folding machines in archaebacteria and in the eukaryotic cytosol. And we determined the structure of this molecular complex, of this molecular machine, by a hybrid approach combining cryo-electron microscopy, in this case, with X-ray crystallography. And what you see on the right-hand side is the structure of the thermosome as um, we, we obtained it. Now, I can't go into details of this machine, but the key feature of this molecule is that by a mechanism of self-assembly. A barrel-shaped architecture is built. It's shown here for a distant relative, Groel, which is the bacterial chaperone. And so it's, it's a barrel-shaped architecture. You can look at it as a sort of a nano compartment because the dimensions are truly in the nanometer scale. We talk here about a dimension in the interior, in the cavity, which is something like six, seven nanometers. And the function of that, that barrel-shaped architecture is to sequester the folding process from the surrounding cytoplasm and to prevent unproductive interactions of unfolded or partly folded intermediates. At the same time, we studied the main molecular machinery of protein degradation, the intracellular protein degradation the proteasome, and we again, we, we discovered our workhorse became a proteasome from an archaebacterium, thermoplasma. And we were amazed to see when we analyzed the architecture that in both the protein folding machinery and the degradation machinery, the same principles prevailed. Again, we have a sort of a nano um, compartment inside this macromolecular complex, again, formed by a process of self-assembly. Now, the active sites of this molecule, the business center, if you like, of, of this molecule, which cleave and uh, destroy proteins, are located in this central cavity here. And any protein that is going to be degraded in this, in this molecule has to be admitted by this narrow gate here at the, end of, at the two ends of this molecule. So we have very similar structural principles here. In the following years, in 95, we had sought the structure in detail by X-ray crystallography. At that time, this was one of the largest protein structures that was being solved. In the meantime, as you know, there are larger ones, such as the ribosome. Now, the, the crystal structure provided many new insights into the architecture of this complex, like detailed insights into the architecture of this little pore here, which gives access to the interior of this machine. This is where the active sites are located. But most important was that it revealed the long time enigmatic nature of the active site. And this was a big surprise at the time. It was an entirely novel enzymatic mechanism with an active site formed by a single amino acid residue, the N-terminal threonine. So you see that here. And knowledge of the structure and the mechanism of the active site, as a matter of fact, paved the way for the development of more potent prote proteasome inhibitors. Now, that is work done by others, by biotech companies in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it was very sort of, of, of it was an experience to see how Entirely curiosity-driven basic research made a major impact on, on this development, and I should say adhere that proteasome inhibitors, as many of you will know, 
in the meantime became very potent drugs for the treatment of various types of cancers, in particular various types of lymphomas. Now, this is only part of the story. It's not sufficient to have a protein degradation machine. It must also know which proteins are should be degraded. It should only degrade proteins which are no longer needed or which are potentially harmful to the cell. And that is where the proteasome and the ubiquitin pathway of protein degradation meet. Now, talking here at the Technion about the ubiquitin system is like carrying olds to Athens. Um, I think most of you, I think probably everybody in the audience knows that the ubiquitin system as a system for selecting and marking proteins for degradation was discovered here by Avram Hershko and Aaron Sikhanova. So, very brief, ubiquitin is a small, highly conserved molecule which via a complex cascade of activating and ligating events becomes covalently attached to a target protein. So it acts as a sort of a death signal. And that death signal is now recognized by the proteasome. Now that proteasome, as, so, as I have described it so far, the 20S proteasome is not sufficient for the degradation and the recognition of ubiquitinated proteins. It requires additional factors, many additional protein subunits to associate forming a regulatory complex. Now, I should say that currently our mechanistic understanding of how the regulatory complex works, what precisely its role is, is still very dimly understood. And the structure we have, which we did many years ago, even though it has been elevated to the status of a U.S. stamp, is a lousy structure. It doesn't reveal much in terms of mechanism. It's so lousy that we decided, after we hadn't worked on that molecule for a long time, we resumed work on it because we cannot leave it like that. Basically, the function of these regulatory complexes are to recognize ubiquitinated proteins, to recycle the ubiquitin to prepare the substrate by unfolding it because only the unfolded substrate can be, can be fed into the degradation machinery itself and it also has a role in opening the gate. Now all I have told you so far has been done with essentially classical biochemistry and classical biochemistry is essentially preoccupied with trying to understand functions displayed by individual molecules and explaining them in the light of their structures. That is what structural biology is about. Now, if we really want to understand the cellular functions of proteins, we need to take other approaches. We can do molecular cell biology, or more fashionable term for that is molecular systems biology, which aim at understanding cellular functions in terms of the interactions of many species of molecules. I look at it as a kind of molecular sociology. Now, the picture of the cell has changed actually quite a bit in recent years, expressed particularly nicely in a review written by Bruce Alberts a couple of years ago. So it's clear that many molecules have to be integrated into functional modules, and these functional modules act like machines which are integrated into assembly lines into a, into, in a factory. But we are not very good in, in revealing the organization of those factories. And that is, as a matter of fact, a reason to reveal them in detail, to reveal them with a precision of a few nanometers. That is why we decided to develop cryo-electron tomography as a, as a method to study the inner organization of cells. Very briefly, we have a cell, and a cell is embedded just in a thin layer of ice. You obtain a set of projection images, and after aligning all these projection images with respect to a common frame of coordinates, we can reconstruct the three-dimensional organization of an object. And if we do that for an entire cell, the resulting image is essentially an image of the cell's entire proteome, which is the entire complement of expressed proteins in that cell. And they depict the network of interactions that underlies higher cellular functions. 
Unfortunately, even having a tomogram which contains this imposing amount of information, it's not a trivial task to retrieve this information simply because for technical reasons the signal-to-noise ratio of these tomograms is extremely poor. And uh, moreover, then the, the inner environment, the environment of the cell is extremely crowded. But we have de developed some computational strategy for the molecular interpretation of tomograms. Very briefly, it is a sort of a pattern recognition technique. What we need to have to interpret the tomograms is we need to have structures of isolated and purified molecules as they tend to accumulate in databases, but in many cases, especially of complex structures, we have to, to generate to determine these structures. So what we do here is we have a tomogram noisy and crowded, provided we have now high or medium resolution structures of the, the components of that cell, we can use them to perform a systematic search of the volume of that cell, pixel by pixel or voxel by voxel. Computationally, it's very challenging because it's not only the location of the molecules that is unknown, also their orientation. So we must do the search for all possible orientations and we must repeat it for every molecule we're interested in. What we obtain as an output is a set of coordinates describing the position and the orientation of all these macromolecules in the cell. Just to give you a feeling, I'll show you a little movie. Here in this prokaryotic cell, we map the location of all the ribosomes. So we have just gone through the tomogram of the cell, through the 3D volume from the top to the bottom. And then we have used a high-resolution structure to determine the coordinates of all the ribosomes in the context of that cell. Now, having the coordinates, we can average the 300 or so ribosomes which exist in that part of the cell and then we can generate an average and we can use this essentially noise-free average to replace the original density, noisy density of the ribosomes in that cell. Now, there are various steps. The movie was a little bit fast. There are various steps where we have to remove false positives, but there are ways of doing it. And we obtain a structure just using the information of the ribosomes inside that cell that is good enough to dock into it high-resolution structures as obtained by X-ray crystallography. And if we do that and insert them and put them into the context of the cell, we generate a sort of a pseudo-atomic map of the inner space of cells. Now, we do that not just for one molecule. We are in the process of doing that for the entire proteome of a cell, for all the macromolecular complexes that exist in the cell. A prerequisite for doing that is that we know what we can expect to find in the cell. So we need to have the genome, we need to have a fairly detailed, ideally a quantitative analysis of the proteome of that cell, and we need, that is a major challenge, template structures. We need structures of all the macromolecules which we can expect to find in that cell. And then we can, one after another, determine their location. So in this case here, we have taken the ribosome and we have, take, we have in that part of, of the cell, we have mapped all the ribosomes. So the next step here was to look at, um, the, at the chaperone in the thermosome. And so we could add the positions of the thermosome and we can see to what extent the protein translation machinery and the protein folding machinery correlate in positions inside that cell. And, well, it, it made a jump, and so we already had also the protein degradation machineries. That is the sort of molecular sociology which I mentioned before. I like to call that visual proteomics. And what visual proteomics tries to do is to provide a molecular atlas, a collection of maps describing the spatial arrangement of the proteome, or of subsets of proteins, and we believe that such atlases will provide a most valuable resource for analyzing cellular interaction networks. And we believe that cryo-electron tomography, in conjunction with computational methods for the interpretation, has the potential to meet this objective and to provide us with maps with nanoscale precision. So far for the science. Let me conclude by saying once again that it's a great honor and it's an encouragement to have received the Harvey Prize in Science and Technology. Projects such as the development of cryo-electron tomography as a tool for molecular cell biology can be inspired and they can be promoted by an individual, but it requires a team to make it work, and the team as a whole 
deserves recognition. I'm most grateful to generations of very talented graduate students and postdocs and for their invaluable contributions and for their enthusiasm in working on a project which many regarded as highly risky or even as not feasible. Moreover, I was privileged to work in an institution, the Max Planck Society, which gave me complete freedom to do what I thought was worth doing and has supported me generously over the past 25 years. And finally, I wish to thank you all for making this a very memorable day for me and for my family. Thank you very much.